Oh, oops, let me get going here. Make sure I got the right tabs up. There we go. I think we're good. We're good. We're good. Okay, let me adjust this a little bit. Just playing with the sound levels a little bit. The sound's a little low, but if I go much higher, then all of a sudden I'm clipping, which isn't good. So I'm um, just playing around with it a little bit. Uh, so welcome on in everybody. We got people showing up here. So um, here we are uh, talking about statistics again. I have not been getting a lot of questions. So uh, in the absence of questions, I assume people are getting it, that peop it's making sense to people, that there aren't any problems. You know, it's kind of the, you know, the old saying, no news is good news. If I'm not hearing from students, I assume that we're, we're progressing well. If you have any kind of concerns or you're getting stressed or you're getting behind or lost, um, do make sure you contact me so I can. It, it, it's a lot easier to help you when you first start to stumble than all of a sudden six, eight weeks later. Right. I sometimes have students come to me in week 15 and 16 and say, you know, this class got away from me. Uh, what can I do? Well, if you have, you know months of of bad scores there's not much we can do at that time but uh when you start to feel right when you start to feel like the class is getting away from you uh that's when you should be getting some help then then it's entirely possible we can do something about it right sometimes a quick conversation and students feel a little bit better and then they're not they're not so nervous to get in there and start the homework it doesn't feel so overwhelming and then we can get you back on track there so um if there is any kind of issue let me know uh, and plus it's helpful then if you're confused on certain stuff, then I know exactly what to talk about the next time in class, right? Uh, we did this in, I think it was my math three, my intermediate algebra class. I had like four students, three or four students ask me this about the same question on the homework. Well, that's a good indication to me. Ooh, I need to talk about that in class, right? Because that's, uh, that's clearly if four students or three or four students are asking about it. That means probably 10 students at least don't understand it. And then we spent the whole time talking about that topic. And a lot of the students felt much better about it after that. So do make sure that you are keeping up with stuff. And if you have questions, uh, let me know, right? Let me know. And then we can kind of direct things. Um, Okay, so here's a question. Should we start working on the project since we're done with unit one or should we wait until after the project questions? This is a good good question. So there's, there, we're kind of in a weird spot and that's why I'm pushing that we, you know, it's really important to get your questions submitted and that I can put together the big survey that everyone's gonna take and we get that survey done because until you have your data back from the survey, until you see how the class has answered your questions, there's not much you can do right uh, statistics is all about crunching data but until you have your data we can't really move forward so we're kind of in a weird zone which is a great question I, I, I like the enthusiasm and the uh, you know trying to get in there and and, uh, and get things done the only thing is we're kind of in a slow zone right now where we can't really move too far into the project until you get your data so that's why it's really important that um, the groups are formed in the next couple days and then the survey questions um, hopefully you're getting those in now, but definitely by September 12th, because there's going to be a pretty quick turnaround after the 12th where I make the survey, give it to you. You have a few days to take the survey and then you're going to have data. And at that point, um, you're only limited by how much you want to work, right? Those of you who want to work ahead through the future chapters and then do that part of your project, you will literally be able to do that, right? So many of you could actually have your project largely completed in the next couple of months or, you know, you can also kind of do the bits at a time after, you know, if you want to work at the uh, whatever the normal pace, the, the prescribed pace by my, my due dates, um, you can do it that way. But by all means, once we have that data, yeah, you have a green light to move ahead. Don't move ahead so fast that, you know, um, you're going to make mistakes and then have to come back and redo it once you kind of learn how to do the topics. But if you work ahead and you have a strong understanding of those chapters, at that point, you will be able to to you know, move more quickly on the, on the, uh, the project. So it, it will be up to you, but at this point you're, you're just limited because you don't have your data yet. Right. Is the only, that's kind of the drawback, uh, to that thing, <coughs> um, at the moment, but that will, that will get taken care of in the next couple of weeks. Um, like I say, starting on the 12th, I'm going to try to have 
you know, the 13th, I'll probably try to put that survey together and get it out, give you a few days to work on it. And then that'll give us, you know, plenty and plenty of time to work on stuff. But so th the one thing about that is it's a little hard because we're kind of getting into displays, the type of displays that you're going to use and not use for your statistics. <coughs> so you're but you you haven't taken the survey yet. So what's going to happen is you're going to work through chapter two and then by the end of chapter two, you'll have your data. You're kind of going to have to come back and remember this chapter in order to create the visuals for your graph. Luckily, that's not very hard. I'll be showing you that once you go into StatCrunch, <coughs> and remember, it tells you up here how to get into StatCrunch. There's instructions up here for like using StatCrunch and stuff. Um, some of this you won't need to use, but, but some of it you can. Um, StatCrunch is going to make making your visuals very easy as far as the actual the actual construction, you're not going to have to sit there with a compass and a ruler and make all your graphs and stuff like that. It will make it, and that makes it very easy for you to play around and go, well, what if my, uh, what if my group size for my histogram is 10? What if it's 5? What if it's 3? And you can play around and find the one that you think tells you the best, tells the best story for the data that you're trying to convey. Okay, and when I say that again, when I say story, I mean like a true story, right? We're trying to do ethical statistics. And there's always a choice. No matter what choice you make in displaying statistics, you're making a choice that's going to, uh, you know, g it gives an impression. You're trying to make an argument about something. And, you you know, we, so hopefully we're doing that in an ethical way where the, the arguments that we are making and the way we're displaying our data is to convey what we believe is the true information, not to mislead, you know, things like cigarettes aren't uh, – damaging or the climate is not really being affected by people and stuff like that. We're not, we're not trying to do that kind of stuff. We're trying to convey information in an honest, ethical way so that, um, you know, then people are informed and can make good decisions about this stuff. That's how statistics is supposed to work, not how it uh, often works because there's, uh, you know, a lot of times people have incentives to do statistics wrong. <coughs> right. Um, okay. So uh, good question. <coughs> Excuse me. So, where are we? Uh, so, organizing data. So, uh, what I will say is most of the graphs that I'm going to show you today that are bad graphs, right? So, they, there's the section graphical misrepresentations of data. Um, okay, yep, yep. So, that's good. You can always watch the, the video later if you're someone who's uh, watching later. Um, good, good to watch it live, but. Uh, Watching it later is better than, than nothing for sure. So you're going to be looking at your popular displays. You're going to be learning about a lot of things that are um, uh, different ways of representing your data, right? So you want to keep a few things in mind. Um, like sometimes people try to overcomplicate things when, they're, when they see something new and they go, oh, here's this new tool and technology can do this very easily for me. So... Um, you know, I'm going to use it. You see this like when people start learning video editing. I don't know how many of you have like learned video editing or do any of that kind of stuff. You know, when you when you get into if you even move used like iMovie or something, um, you know, there's all these fancy like transitions they have. And you go, oh, I can just put this transition between these two clips. And then look, it does like a weird circle swipe or it does some kind of weird checkerboard thing where the checkers flip and then you see the new clip. And it, and it looks kind of neat when you first – uh, see those and go wow this is really easy to put these transitions in there and then when you actually watch your video you go oh, this is terrible all those transitions are actually distracting and they don't really help uh, they don't make a, a smooth transition all right that's kind of a lesson people have to learn when they're doing video editing um, it's the same thing with statistical visualizations just because you can make something that's very complicated does not mean that you should so there are a few over you know uh, overarching sort of guidelines that you should try to follow when you are doing visualizations for your data, okay? And the one that you're going to hear me talk about, it's one that I use when I grade. This is one where if I, if I see this done wrong, you, were, you will lose points on your project and your work that you do, and that is that your graph should be well labeled, okay? Everything should be labeled. You should be able to hand somebody nothing but your graph and they shouldn't have to ask you any questions about what it means, right? So that's kind of the game. If you hand someone your graph and they have to ask you, what does the y-axis represent? You, you lost. You have a bad graph, right? Or if they have to ask, what is, what is the bottom, what, what is the horizontal uh, 
dimension represent, then you lose, right? You should have all the information there so that people can look at it and they can they can understand exactly what your graph is saying. So notice how, remember, I've, I mentioned this before, and we'll look at some examples of different stuff here in a little bit, but your graph should include a label, so saying what it is, and then also the unit that you use. So if your, um, you know, if your y-axis is the height of men that were measured in a study, then your your vertical axis should say men's heights, and then whatever unit you used, like inches or feet and inches or centimeters or meters, whatever it is, um, you should you should say that that should be clearly written there so that when you you know if you just hand someone on the street your graph and they look at it and say okay the y-axis is the heights of men given in meters okay i get it I, I know exactly what the height of all these bars is that's um that's the height of these guys right <clears throat> so uh always label your graph if you if there's a part of your graph that you go should i should i be labeling this part the answer is yes okay <coughs> It's just, it's that simple. It's yes, you should be labeling it, okay? Um, the, the goal, this, here's the kind of thing. No one wants to go back and look at all your scratch work and your calculations. You don't want to look at other people's calculations and scratch work and go over all this stuff. Your boss doesn't want to do that either at your future job where you, you know, may or may not be using statistics. Your boss doesn't want to have to spend all this time going through your stuff. They just want the graph that's going to go in the report that your team is making and look at the graph and say, yes, the shareholders are going to like this graph. Good. Put it in there, right? That's, that's, that's what you want. The graph tells the whole story. So that's one of the first things you want. Make sure your graph is labeled. If you show me a graph on the project that is not well labeled, then I have to go, I wonder what the y-axis represents. Even if you say it, even if you say this is what the y-axis represents, it needs to be in the graph. So that is definitely something where um, some points get deducted. So it's easy. Just do that. Every time you make a graph in this class, label it. On StatCrunch, it gives you an option for labeling. And basically any tool that does statistical representations is going to give you an option to label things well. Okay, a well-labeled graph. Um, uh, so that's one of the things you want to use. Another sort of guiding principle is only make things more complicated when it actually helps right when it actually makes it better kind of like what i was talking about a minute ago with the video transitions people like to put really fancy ones in there um, it's actually distracting from your video that you're trying to create if you if you have like really fancy transitions in there because now people are waiting like three seconds for this like screen wipe to happen or whatever and they're like yeah let's just get to the next the next thing that we need so um, it's the same thing with a statistical graph don't try to go overly fancy. Like, don't find the the fanciest graph in here in the book and use it just because you go, well, it's the most complicated thing, so let's use that one. You want to use the simplest tools because that's how communication is best best done, right? Your graph, your visualization is ultimately a form of communication. You are communicating information to someone else. Now, um, I can communicate to you in a very simple way where the information is easily conveyed or I can communicate to you in a very complicated way where you're kind of confused and going, what, wait, what, is he, what did he just talk about? I'm not sure. It's the same thing with a graph. We want to have the simplest form of a graph that gets your message across. Now, it may be that your message is very complex and will involve a very complex graph, but then you can justify it because you can say, you know, we looked at different graphs and this really is the best one. Then it's okay right but um sort of the default should always be a simpler graph like a histogram it's about as easy as it gets histograms probably the most used graph in statistics right because it's simple people understand it they know how to read it for the most part um, if it's well labeled it conveys the information it gives, it gives us lots of information are there more complicated ways of conveying the information yes um, should you be using some of them maybe right and i know that's it's one of the frustrating things about this course is that, uh, you know, I'm not sitting down and saying you need two histograms, one bar chart, you need a pie graph, you need to do a dot plot. Like, um, you know, students are like, well, well, what should I do? But, but that's how statistics works is that all of your projects are different and all of your data is different. And part of, part of doing statistics is sitting down and deciding which graph makes sense for you. 
Okay, so you might you might do a question on the project where um, you show one visualization, and then you might have another question on your project where you show two visualizations, or maybe even three visualizations. If showing another graph adds more information, then do that. Okay, um, you might show one graph because you're trying to make one point about your data, and then you say, let's you know here we're looking at a um, you know a scatter plot involving this data. Now we're looking at a histogram. There may be a good reason why you use both of those visualizations. It just, it just whatever is going to support the narrative that you're trying to go with. So I know it's frustrating, but the, but the truth is there's no right or wrong answer about which visualization should I use for quantitative data. Well, it's way more complicated than that, and you're going to have to kind of dive into the stat crunch and start making these graphs <coughs> to figure out... Um, to figure out which one looks best. Luckily, it does it in an instant, right? You change a couple parameters, hit enter, and it makes your histogram. And you go, I wonder if we can do better than that. Change a couple parameters, hit enter, it makes another one, and you go, oh, that looks better. Let's use this one, right? So you literally can make a new histogram every few seconds, and then you'll just choose the one that you think is the best looking one, okay? But it does, like, if you're going with your first histogram, might not be the best choice, right? Because you don't know, because you haven't seen if they're, what the other ones look like. <coughs> This happens all the time in the in stats class when we're you know when we're in the classroom we do a few more um, like um, activities in class where we're actually collecting data in class and then making graphs from it and since we're collecting the data in class I don't know what the data is going to look like ahead of time so that's what we do we collect the data and I'll look at a histogram and go like I make my best guess for what's a good histogram and we look at it and go okay that's not bad let's try this other histogram ooh this one looks better. It, it wasn't what I thought was going to look better, but it does look better. It tells a better story. It gives more information about what we're trying to convey. So that's kind of uh, wh where you should go. Um, you know, where they talk about like the, you've got your organizing qualitative data and organizing quantitative data. So it's, <coughs> <coughs> so it's set up quite well. When you are, when you have your data back, from the survey in a couple of weeks after you've taken the survey, you can come back and you can go, okay, here's our qualitative questions, that is categorical questions, and you can just, you know, if you want, even just rewatch the lesson and go, okay, that's what we should use for those kinds of questions, and you'll know which options you can use for your qualitative data. And then look at the quantitative data, the popular displays, and, and this other one, and you can look at those and go, that's right, that's, we should use this one for this question, we should use this other one for this question, and then you put all that information together, right? So I know it sounds like I'm leaving it very open-ended, but it's really, it's not that hard because StatCrunch does all the, the actual drawing and everything. So you can just try a bunch of stuff till, till you like the way it looks and then go with that, okay? Uh, and then you're, you're gonna wanna try to avoid the graphical misrepresentations of data. Those, you don't wanna make those mistakes, right? And, and most of you, uh, in this class, at least, you'll be making them on accident, right? In the real world, people misuse statistics intentionally a lot because they stand to gain from it. In this class, it's just people making mistakes because you're new at statistics. So we're going to talk about some of those kinds of things. So you've got graphs. You want them well-labeled, right? That's step one. Your graph is essentially useless if it's not well-labeled so that someone can look at it and know exactly what it represents. Uh, and also a well-labeled graph like a lot of times that's what people like right is pictures people don't actually like to read words anymore they s sort of read as few words as they can possibly get through reading in a day that's that's how much reading most people like to do these days um, but they like pictures right so you show them a picture that's really what people are going to look at right you you open say uh, Newsweek or something like that there's a whole article on whatever some kind of social issue um, people skip all the words and go right to the picture and go, hmm, can I get anything from this picture? And then they don't bother to read the words. So you want to keep that in mind. Like, I'm going to watch everything that you say in the video. But as far as someone learning statistics, you should just be aware that your your average person doesn't like to read words, right? They, they like to look at pictures. So your picture should be really strong. If you think, well, you know, I put the information in the text, most people are never going to read that. So you, you want whatever whatever you're trying to convey really needs to be in that picture. You want that picture to be bulletproof. You want it to tell the story and support the argument that you were trying to make because a lot of people, that's all they're going to look at. <coughs> okay. So um, popular displays. Let's see what we got here. So one thing that you're going to want to be able to do early on 
is what's called a frequency table. And the frequency table is sometimes made, I just pulled up this page here. This frequency table is sometimes made for, um, the frequency table is sometimes made because you want a frequency table. Sometimes you just want to include a frequency table in your, in your work. It can be helpful to do that. But oftentimes the frequency table is used because it is an intermediate step to get to your histogram. Okay, histograms get used a lot. You probably should have at least one and probably multiple histograms in your project. If you don't, I'm kind of going to wonder, they didn't really have anything that could be represented in a histogram? That seems unlikely to me. It's possible. You know, I'll consider your data, but you probably should have at least one and probably a few histograms to represent your data that you should be showing along the way. So what is a frequency table? Well, imagine you get your data back like this. This is what it's going to look like when you get your data back, right? So this, this is sort of a made up experiment here I'm showing on screen where they dropped soccer balls and the soccer ball either landed in box A or it landed in box B. And then they kept track of that. Well, just look at this string of letters here. A, B, A, 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 B, A, B, A. I mean, you look at that and about all you can say was, well, it looks like more boxes, more, more of the balls fell in box A than B, but that's not, that's not very good analysis, right? There's, there's not much I can do when it's in row form like this with the raw data. Um, so what we do is we create a frequency table. Basically, you go through and you count the number of A's and you count the number of B's and you just present that. See how much simpler this is, right? How many, how many of the, uh, where's our frequency? That's actually... They have a couple of frequency tables here, but here we've got like um, just counting frequency of balls dropping in box A, eight, right? That's a lot more clear. The, it communicates the information a lot better than going at this and trying to look like, well, there's some B's and there's some A's. I don't know. You just give the count. This many balls fell in box A. This many balls fell in box B, right? Or, and that's not quite how they're setting this up, but that's probably how we would do it if we were just trying to summarize trial A go there were this many A's there were this many B's that's all you really need to know right you don't need to know that they fell in a specific order of A B A A A A B A B A it's not really going to change anything okay oh one one thing I want to talk about uh, that I think I've talked about last time but I want to make it explicitly clear when you are writing your questions for the survey make sure that you specify how you want the data input because otherwise what's going to happen later is you're going to have to go through and you're going to have to translate all the data into the form that you want. So for instance, like I see this done with what seems like a pretty basic question, which is um, what is your height, right? So that's, that seems like a reasonable question. What is your height? And then people answer, but you're going to get a lot of different forms. You're going to get people uh, saying, um, well, I am, uh, Let's see, what would it be like? Uh, someone say like, well, I'm 71 inches tall. Okay. And then someone else says, well, I'm five foot nine. Well, it's you, you, you now have your data in two different forms and, st and stack crunch is going to have a real time crunch, a hard time crunching that data. So what I would recommend is think about your units when you are asking your survey questions. So you shouldn't just say, uh, what is your height? You could say, what is your height in inches? And then everyone's going to figure out, okay, I'm 68 inches tall. And then they, and then they put their answer in there or whatever. Right. But, um, otherwise what's going to happen is half the class is going to answer in like, I'm five foot eight. And then stat crunch is not going to know what to do with that because of the notation. And you're going to have to convert it all to inches. So think about units when you are creating your, um, your questions, because if your data is answered in the right form, it's real easy. Uh, you'll you'll be surprised how easy it is to just go into StatCrunch and have it just make a histogram for you or whatever, right? So keep that in mind. But you should be able to do a histogram by hand as well. It's helpful that say, um, <clears throat> it's helpful that StatCrunch can do these things for us very easily. But you should understand how to construct one. If you've constructed a couple histograms by hand you're always going to understand how histograms work, right? You're never going to forget or get confused later. They're always going to make sense to you, okay? So that frequency table is helpful, and as you'll see, it's the next step into making a histogram.
when, when we do that. So they talk about creating a frequency table here. So here's one. Um, uh, this table was, uh, they talk about tally marks, right? Most people know how to take tally marks. You're counting, right? Everyone in the class knows how to count. You can go through and count things. Um, and then you, you keep your stuff up. Um, so uh, in this state, in this case, you're gonna make, you're gonna make some, the, whatever number of columns that you need. You're counting up the number of things that you're concerned about. And you can, we can see we have a frequency table here, right? This is the day of the week. Oops, so we've got the day of the week. We've got the number of customers. So they counted customers coming in. So that's the counting part. But it's a whole lot easier to just have this frequency at the end, right? Frequency means how many times does something happen? That's all frequency means. And a lot of people, they think about like, well, what about the frequency of like a radio wave or something? It's literally counting the number of times that that wave crests, right? The number of cycles that it has. Um, so, you, so frequency of say a radio station is still counting the number of times that a thing happens. It's counting the, the number of cycles in that wave per second. Um, frequency of here a store, counting the number of customers, that's your frequency of customers, how many people showed up, okay? So that's, that's really all this is, is would you rather look at these green dashes or would you rather just look at the totals? It's generally easier to just look at the totals um, of something that uh, has occurred. Okay, so that's your frequency table. Once we have that, we can use a histogram. <coughs> Now, histograms, super important. You're going you're gonna to watch about them in the videos and stuff like that, and you're going to learn about them a little bit. Um, and you should definitely be making histograms along the way. A histogram, so when to use a histogram? Use of histogram when? The data are numerical. You generally are going to need some kind of numerical data, and by that we mean, you know, it should be, it should actually be quantitative. It's not enough to say numerical because if it's jersey numbers or something like that or telephone number is not really going to be helpful. But it should be, you know, so it should be quantitative in nature. Um, and we want to see the shape of the data's distribution. This is something we haven't talked about yet, but we will be talking about it. Um, well, I've talked about it briefly. Uh, but we have not spent a whole chapter on it like we will coming up. The shape of data is very, very important. It's nice to throw metrics at something like the mean. The mean tells us where the center of something is, but it doesn't tell us about the shape. I think I gave the example last time of talking about how, um, you know, there's two outcomes for having a class score with a mean of 80 on an exam. Everyone takes the exam and everyone gets an 80 exactly. Then the mean is 80, right? Or we take the test and half the class gets 60 and half the class gets 100. The mean is still 80, but those scores are very different in those two sets. Everyone getting 80 is a very different outcome than half the class getting 60 and half the class getting 100, right? So what's different about those two, shape, uh, two sets? It's the shape of the data. Right? And I don't expect you to understand 100% of what that means, but that's one thing we want to see in our visualization is the shape of the data. You can kind of see it happening here. Um, right, and a histogram is a great way to, cre uh, to, sh to con communicate that shape of the data to people. Right, and we'll, we'll talk more about that. So let's blow this up. Few things that we should know about, oops, that's the wrong one. Focus on the wrong screen here. Let me blow this one up. <coughs> Find my cursor. Okay, so what does a histogram look like? So we've got one here on screen. <coughs> Okay, see how this is well labeled? This is what I was talking about. This is just an example, but look, they've got defects per hour. So I know, okay, this, these numbers down here, those are the number of defects that happen in an hour. Okay, and the frequency right here is a histogram of quality defects. So defects are coming up. Um, how many times has this occurred? The frequency of that thing occurring, right? So in other words, um, it looks like what happened here was someone went through and they were keeping track of, you know, some type of manufacturing process and manufacturing is not perfect, right? Defects happen and you want to eliminate the number of defects because that's essentially waste, 
usually on a production line. So you want to reduce that. So someone went through and kept track of for each hour that this manufacturing plant was running, you had some options. You could have um, zero defects in an hour, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12. And then it looks like it doesn't really go above that. Um, so they kept track for each hour that went by, they kept track of how many defects were occurring per hour. And then they went in and looked at the frequency of that. So remember the frequency of how many times that occurs. So in other words, we would look at this and say, this bar here is representing the hours when there were three defects in one hour. How many times did that occur? Well, it looks like it happened probably, it looks like that's probably 16, 16 times. So of all the hours that we, rec we, we recorded, 16 times there were three defects in an hour. Does that make sense? Um, so I know this is this is one of the ones that's a little confusing to uh, it takes a minute to kind of digest what's going on in this graph but see how it's see how everything's labeled we've got numbers here that make it very clear it's not it's not overly cramped they didn't feel the need to put in the two and the three and the four and the five and the six they kind of lightened it up a little bit so we have less numbers but I know what this is this is three because it's between two and four Right. These are the kind of little details that you're going to be making when you make your representations and you decide how things are going to look. Right. I know this is five right here because it's between four and six. There doesn't have to be a five there to let me know. OK, so that's what your histogram should look like. Notice that there's no gaps between the bars in my histogram. That's one of the things that you definitely want to get straight, because if you make a histogram and you put gaps in between your bars, it looks like you don't know what you're doing because you don't know what you're doing. So um, you want to make sure that you realize your your histogram, those bars should be up against each other. Now, we want to be careful. That said, it is possible to have gaps between your bars and your histogram, but that's only if you have a count of zero. So you, you want to kind of I, I want to make very clear what I'm saying here. What if the number seven, what if we didn't have any hours that passed where we had seven defects? Then this bar will be all the way at the bottom. Right. So then you could argue, well, then don't I have a gap between six and eight? Well, I almost would not call that a gap in the data because you have a marker there that is indicating zero. So it's not an absence of data. It's just that your data is all the way to the bottom. What I'm talking about is when we have bar graphs, like if we were going to do a bar graph of eye color, you ask everyone in the class, what's your eye color? We're not going to have those bars touch each other because in this case, it makes sense that the bars touch because there, there's a continuum right here, right? There's a continuity where two, once you go above two, you're at what, three? Once you go above three, you're at four, then you're at five, six, seven. So there's a continuity between all these numbers. It's a continuous uh, row right there. So it makes sense that all those bars should be touching. If you think about it in the context of eye color, does it make sense that once you go above blue eyes, it now becomes brown eyes? No, there's no real natural ordering to those. They're more in categories, so we use what's called a bar chart, which has gaps in between the bars. The histogram should only have gaps in between these bars if, uh, if one of your values is zero. Okay, so hopefully, hopefully I didn't confuse you. Hopefully I made that more clear um, when we did that. <clears throat> okay, all right. So, um, and that's kind of what your histogram is going to look like. Oh, and let's talk about the basic shapes of your data. So where are those? Um, right, here we go. So you're going to hear the word normal a lot in this class, right? N when you talk about statistics, the word normal comes up a lot and it has a little bit different definition in statistics than it does in everyday life. This happens with mathematics as well. We have definitions for things and they don't necessarily mean the same thing that you're going to, you're talking about when you talk to your friend, you know, you're at a, whatever, you're having dinner with your friend and you use the word normal, you probably don't mean it in the way that statistics means it. Um, when we say normal, you should be thinking symmetric and bell-shaped. Okay, so see how it's kind of shaped like a bell? Now, that there's lots of different ways this can be bell-shaped. It can be taller, it can be shorter, but I think you could argue, yeah, that ha kind of has a basic bell shape, you know, like someone ringing a bell that you've seen, kind of has this shape. 
so bell shaped and it's symmetric if I cut a, if I cut a line down the middle here and I fold this shape over on itself it's approximately gonna line up on itself okay in the real world you never get data that is 100% perfectly symmetric but we don't really care right if it's close enough that like when you look at this and you go yeah that kind of looks symmetric to me and it looks like it's a bell shape then most of the time uh, we're fine with calling it normal. We'll call it a, you know, ca sort of capital N normal. There's like lowercase n normal that we use when we're talking to people. Capital N normal is in statistics when we mean, you know, we'll get to a formal definition later. But right now, just, just remember two things, bell-shaped and symmetric. If that's the case, then, then you can use normal. We do have... I think there's one tool, I forget which one it is off the top of my head, which is a little more strict about this definition of normal. But like 95% of the time when we are when we care if something is normal or not, you can get it just by looking at it and going bell shape, check, symmetric, check. Okay, let's move ahead with our, our normal, normal uh, tools. Because what's going to happen is there are certain tools that and we're going to learn that say, if you have a normal distribution, then you can do this. Well, then you have to ask yourself, well, is my data normal? Does it have a normal distribution? Yes. Okay, then I can use this statistical tool. If you try to use this statistical tool on something that isn't normal, your data, your conclusions and your, your calculations just, they won't make any sense, right? St uh, StatCrunch will still run the calculation for you, but it's going to be meaningless and then your, your work's just all like, sort of made of nonsense so you want to get used to sort of recognizing that this thing right here is like perfectly symmetric but usually you're gonna have one of these bars will be a little bit higher on one side and a little bit lower on the other but you know if you folded it over you'd go yeah it's more or less normal more or less okay um, then we can have a right skewed distribution oops let me get it on there so basically skewed uh, sometimes things will be skewed left, sometimes things will be skewed right. So in this case, we would not say this is normal, right? If I, uh, it doesn't really look like a bell to me, although you could kind of argue, well, half looks like a skinny bell and the other half looks like a wider bell, but it's um, not really bell shaped and it's certainly not symmetric, right? We could see in this case, if I folded, if I cut a line down, the, down this, this high part right here and folded this over, this part is in no way going to fold over nicely on this part. So that's what we call a skewed distribution. It's skewed one way or the other. And a lot of times if your data comes out skewed, if you look at it and your histogram looks like this, your next question should be why. Why is my data skewed? What is causing my data to be skewed in this way? And by asking that question, you will uncover uh, some I interesting information about your data. That's the whole thing is we're trying to take data and make interesting conclusions about the data that we are collecting. Well, that by answering, why is my data skewed to the right and coming up with a reasonable explanation that seems to fit, we now have learned something. We now know something about the question that you asked, which is the whole point of asking a question is to learn things, right? For instance, um, if we took a it wouldn't look exactly like this, but we would get a similar histogram for this if we took the ages in people's classroom. This part would be a little taller, and this part would be a, would come down a little quicker, but we would get a graph that looks something like this. It would be a right skewed distribution if we took the ages of people in the class and probably for the school. So why is that? We'd go, okay, why would we get a right skewed distribution for ages of students at Ventura College? Okay. Well, it's very common that people enter college around the age of 18. So a lot of people at our college are age 18, 19, then, you know, kind of 20, right? Those are, the, those are the ages where we have a lot of students in those ages. And you might say, well, then shouldn't it be kind of cut off? People don't go to college before 18, do they? Uh, we do have students at Ventura College who are young as 14 uh, for various reasons and various programs. Um, there are high school programs where some students choose to take college classes instead of high school classes. So we do get some students. So you'd get, you know, there's usually only a couple, but there's, uh, you know, a few 14 year olds taking classes on campus, couple 15 year olds, 16 year olds, a little more, 17, a few more. And then, then you start to see like the, 
you know, this would probably be like 18, 19, 20 would be right around in this zone right here, right? These, these bars would probably be a little lower than they are, but you'd see a big jump at 18, 19, 20. And then, you know, usually at that point, people are transferring somewhere. Not always, right? I spent four years at community college because I couldn't decide what my major was. I kept changing my major. So it took me four years to sort of get everything uh, filled out at community college. So I'd be one of these people over here that like was still at community college at like age, what, 22 or something like that. Um, but, you know, we see and then... Um, a lot of people are transferring to university, so we, we see it kind of go down. And then, But we do have people who are coming back for a second career. They've done one career for 20 years, and for whatever reason, that career is not for them anymore. Some people burn out in certain careers. Sometimes careers go away, right? Sometimes jobs, a lot of jobs each year, more jobs are getting replaced by software and robots. So people say, you know, I used to, I used to put the doors on the... the, uh, the um, you know, the new cars in the factory, I did that for 20 years and now a robot does it, right? That some people don't realize a lot of the, the new, the new car factories that are being built have like a dozen people working at them, right? There's, there was one famously in the news where there's literally like 12 people in the whole factory and they're just maintaining the robots that put the whole vehicles together. So we used to have hundreds of people. You now have like 12, right? Not, not every car factory is that way, but there, there are some that are cutting edge, whereas like a handful of people run, keeping the place running and the robots do everything. So that's a whole lot of people that go, I need a new career. So they come back. So, um, you know, we see this, we do see people at the higher ages, but we see them at a lower rate. So see how we constructed that narrative that supported the shape of the data that we got. And that gives us some insight as to what type, you know, like for the ages, oh, this is this gives me some understanding of the ages of students at Ventura College. And that's very helpful for us because we as faculty and administration, we make decisions that directly affect the students of Ventura College. We have to understand the students of Ventura College in order to make good decisions. And we can understand the students better by understanding the data that comes back to us. So like a right skewed distribution, okay? Um, this is what we call bimodal. Uh, you don't really hear it called double peaked too much, but bimodal distribution just means you have kind of these two, two groups right here. I see this on tests sometimes. Uh, you take a test, you have a, a and you can kind of see why you would get a bimodal distribution for students in most math classes, you have a group of students who are trying to do the least amount of work they can to pass, right? Not every class, but certain classes you get, you know, people are like, I literally want to get 70.0% so I can do the least amount of work I can and still pass the class. I'm, I'm aiming for that 70.0, which by the way is never a good idea because if you aim for 70.0, you're, you're probably going to come up a little bit short and then you're going to be asking me for like extra credit, except if you were aiming to do as little work as possible, why would I grant you extra credit, right? So if you're just trying to pass and you're like, I'm fine with the C, at least aim for like 74, 75%. And then when you come up short, you're still at a passing grade, okay? But you get students who want to do as little work as possible, just get through the course, and they're aiming for a C. So hopefully they at least get that C. So you'll see you know, a group of students that are just kind of passing and that would also include some students who, who are working very hard but just aren't, aren't um, you know, they're struggling with the class for whatever reason. So a lot of times you get a group that's right around, right above 70. And then you'll get the group of students that are like, I, I want to have a, you know, I want to have a high GPA. I want to understand statistics. I want to be really knowledgeable about this stuff. So they're going for the A. So you have another group. So it's kind of the group of students that are really like gung ho and like, I just, I want to do great in college and I want to really understand this and, the, and statistics is going to help me get into a better career. They will pay more, uh, you know, so there's this group up here. Um, and then there's kind of a dip in the B grades, you know, a few students still getting Bs, but a dip. And then you get the, the barely passing grades and you get like that. So this, so see how I did that? I put a narrative on the data that then, you know, it works the other way around usually well, I guess that's still how it would work is you have the data, although I'm making up the story for these, but you have your data, you look at the shape of it, and then you try to understand well, how did this come about? Like what, like what would be the explanation for this kind of data? And you do your best to give a good explanation. Uh, you can have 
what they call multimodal, which is where you get a number of peaks for whatever reason. Uh, you know, could be could be lots of things. Um, then, then we're getting to the ones you see sort of less and less. A lot of times we'll talk about these these later. You get what's called an edge peak distribution, which is just sometimes you get something out on the edge of something. You get a peak like that. Um, uh, and sometimes you have data missing in the middle, right? Whenever you have a gap in your data, so remember how I said the histogram, the bars should always be close together? Well, here's a good example of, nope, there's a big gap here. But it's not a gap because we're just naturally putting gaps between our bars. It's a gap because the data in the middle is indicating zeros through this whole way, right? Whenever you see a gap in your data, you should ask why. Why is there a gap right there? Because that's probably going to indicate something interesting to you. It could, it could just be a reflection of how your data was collected, how you collected that data, or it could be that something is occurring that's making, um, that's, that's actually affecting the way you collect data. For instance, um, let's say, you know, these weather machines that are out there that sort of, uh, collect data all day long on temperature and wind speed and humidity and stuff like that. Let's say we have something working 24 hours a day collecting that information. And then all of a sudden, every day at 11 o'clock, we're missing data. There's like just no data collected. And we're like, what is going on? Why is there, why is, why am I not getting anything here? So then we go to our data collection machine and look at it and realize, oh, at 11 o'clock every day, the, you know, as the sun is shifting, at 11 o'clock every day, the sun hits our thing directly and overheats it. So the thing shuts down for an hour. And then as the sun continues to move, then it gets back in the shade and then it works again, right? So in that case, we actually found an error in our data collection by looking at a gap. Um, sometimes gaps can be useful for other things. There's a, in another book that I use, there's an example where they take weights of pennies and you get a collection of pennies that are, you know, there's a little bit of variation, but they have one weight. And then there's a big gap and then another collection of pennies. And you go, why would the pennies have gaps like that? Well, it's because they changed the way they made pennies in, I don't remember, 1982 or something like that. Um, they switched to a cheaper metal, which is lighter. So actually there's the old pennies, which are heavier, the new pennies, which are lighter, but you might not have understood that until you looked at the data and realized there's a gap here. What, what is explaining this gap? And then you try to explain it, okay? Oh, and we didn't even get to the bad graphs today. We just got through the sort of... Uh, early basics of what we're looking at. So frequency tables, important histograms. I, I sort of hate to say this, but it, it could be the case that the histogram is the most important visualization, at least for numerical data that you run across. It's probably the most used. It's the easiest to understand. Uh, you definitely want to understand how to do histograms and make good histograms. Um, and we will look next time, which will be what Thursday. So we meet Tuesday. Um, just a reminder, there's a holiday next week, but it won't affect us because we're a Tuesday, Thursday class, right? So we will still meet on the normal day. But in case you have other classes on Monday, just re realize there's a holiday. Um, so we will still meet Tuesday and I will talk more about this. So I will make a note that we let talked about. So talked about frequency tables and histograms. So we'll talk more about, uh, I won't uh, tr hopefully not repeat myself too much, but I know where I left off. So we'll talk about that next time. Um, <coughs> so it sounded like someone already said their group had some questions for me. That's great. Stick around and, and ask me those questions. For those of you who are forming your groups, hopefully you have your group fully formed. Start working on your questions. It's not something that you want to throw together last minute because if there are parts you haven't thought about, about units, how should I ask how tall people are? Oh, I should probably ask in inches. That's the easiest way to go. If you haven't thought those things through, you're going to be creating more work for yourself down the road when you have to go through and convert all that data by hand from 5 feet 8 inches to 68 inches. Um, you're going to have to do all that by hand. Um, or you might just have questions that were asked in such a poor way that your data is just not going to go well. So keep that in mind. Okay. With that said, I'm going to shut down the YouTube stream. I will stay in Zoom for anyone that wants to talk to me and ask me questions. Uh, it's a great opportunity to do so.